One more question on this section. What about the mitochondria of other species that are related to humans, like well, seabirds, for example, have to fly like 500 or 1,000 miles without stopping day and night to get to their next location. Right. Are their mitochondria more efficient than ours? Okay, so yes, it's a very interesting situation. Um, there seems to be a lot of difference in terms of the, um, the, the, fun the, the cleanliness, so to speak, of mitochondrial function. Uh, but again, that's not actually relevant to this question. Um, mitochondrial um, DNA of other species, all other vertebrates, encodes exactly the same 13 genes as human mitochondrial DNA. That's a very important thing. So if it's damaged, then it's going to have the same sort of effect on mitochondrial function as, as it happens in humans. Now, one thing we do know about birds is that their mitochondria seem to make free radicals at a lower rate, at a lower um, just rate of production than... Um, than the mammalian mitochondria do. And that's a really interesting result. It may well have a lot to do with aging because it may affect the rate at which mitochondrial mutations happen, apart from anything else. But it may also have other effects on aging that don't have anything to do with mitochondrial mutations, like the creation of protein oxidation that contributes to accumulation of lipofusin in the lysosome, for example. So there's a lot of different mechanisms by which free radical production contributes to aging, and they're all going to be affected by making mitochondrial, make mitochondria produce free radicals at a lower rate. But again, this has really nothing to do with which components of the free radical producing machinery actually are nuclear coded versus mitochondrially encoded. Thank you, Aubrey. Can we move to... Sure. There's another aspect of aging that I want to talk about, and I'm only going to talk about it very briefly because I don't have very long. How long do I have, by the way? How, long, how am I doing for time? Outstanding. Okay. Um, if you want to know more than I have time to talk about with respect to this, then you can ask the man who's sitting at the back over there, who has been responsible for a lot of the work I'm going to be talking about over the next five minutes. His name's John Schlerndorn. He's the head of our research center up in Sunnyvale. He's also a uh, just finishing PhD student at, the, at Arizona State University in the outskirts of Phoenix, and he's a complete spaceman. Um, he's a genius. I don't know where we'd be without him. Um, so anyway, um, one of, the one of the other problems, nothing to do with mitochondria in this, talk, in this part of the talk, one of the other problems that we have in aging is something that was touched on briefly by John Ferber, um, the accumulation of indigestible molecules of one sort or another. Now, John emphasized in his talk, he was talking about the stuff that happens in the spaces between our cells, in the connective tissue and other um, molecules that are between cells. Um, but I'm going to talk about what happens inside cells. This is the inside of a neuron. In particular, it's a cross-section, using an electron microscope, of the long part of a neuron, the axon, and it's in a brain that's suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And as you can see, it's not at all happy. What's going on here, essentially, is a failure of degradation. There's lots of stuff in here that the cell is trying to break down, and it's not succeeding in doing so. And we're pretty sure that this has a lot to do, at least at certain stages, with the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And we see this in other neurodegenerative diseases, too. Here is an analogous phenomenon in the artery wall. Here what we've got is nothing um, like the same sort of chemicals that are accumulating. In the previous slide, it's mainly proteins. Here it's mainly lipids, in particular cholesterol derivatives. Um, but the effect is basically the same. It's bad for the cell. These cells are not working as well as they used to. They used to be able to process cholesterol really well, and now they can't. And these are things called foam cells. It's the first stage of atherosclerosis, and we want to have it not happen. Right, now... Um, about 10 years ago, about a year before the famous meeting in this hotel, I had an idea that I thought might actually be a way of addressing these problems, which we can call late-onset storage diseases, problems of failure to break things down that eventually cause cell dysfunction. And the idea is drawn from an area of biology that had not previously been applied to anything biomedical at all. It had been applied to a completely different application, namely environmental decontamination. So the concept is called bioremediation. It was first developed nearly 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago now, actually, by a professor named Ed Gale. And he called it the, mitochondri sorry, the, um, the microbial infallibility hypothesis. And this is it. He said, well, hang on. It's a little bit surprising that we see such diversity in the ecology, in the microbial ecology, in most environments that we look in. Because what we would surely expect is that for a given environment, there'll be certain things to eat, to live off, 
okay? And some bacteria will be able to live off these things and metabolize them more rapidly than others, and they will grow faster and they will just take over. So we'll see one or two bacterial species dominating the population. We don't see that. We see a lot of variety. Why is that? And he said, well, maybe it's because most environments have some sources of energy, sources of nutrition, that are hard to break down. Things that are intrinsically difficult to break down, and therefore most bacteria just don't know how. They don't have the genetic wherewithal to do it. And maybe those ones, therefore, can carve out an ecological niche for themselves without being able to grow particularly fast. They, don't, they can grow more slowly than the other bacteria, just as so long as those fast-growing bacteria can't eat the thing that they can eat. And it turns out to be true. He realized that this could be applied um, to the problem of environmental decontamination, of pollution, because many pollutants are, are energy-rich molecules, and they're organic. In other words, if you can break them down, you can live off them, okay? But they're indeed hard to break down. He was thinking of things like explosives, TNT, plastics, uh, dioxin is another example. Um, uh, even rubber, if you go to the side of the highway, um, there's a lot of rubber coming off, you know, pulverized rubber coming off tires all the time. So he said, well, maybe that will mean that we'll actually be able to find bacteria in polluted environments that can break down the pollutant. And maybe the only reason that the pollutant is still there is because there aren't enough of those bacteria. And it turned out he was right. It turns out that if you go to such environments, you do almost always find bacteria that can break the thing down that you want to get rid of. And this can be used as a mechanism for getting rid of the pollution just by extracting those bacteria, identifying them, growing them into larger numbers in the laboratory, sticking them back in that environment, and your, pollution, your pollutant goes away. So that has an, is an idea that's been around a while, and bioremediation is, thus, is not by any means just a concept. It's a very thriving commercial um, um, enterprise. I said, well, hang on, there are some environments that are actually enriched in human remains. And these environments may be places to look for bacteria that can break down the sorts of substances that accumulate in the human body with such devastating medical consequences. Because these um, things that accumulate are exactly what we like. They're energy rich, they're organic, they're obviously abundant in the body, and um, graveyards are enriched in them. Graveyards do, of course, accumulate some components of the human body, but the ones they accumulate are not the energy-rich ones. They accumulate bones and teeth, for example. Um, and these things I was talking about earlier, don't, they just disappear. So this is, this is circumstantial evidence, of course, but it's nevertheless interesting evidence that maybe microbes exist in those environments that can break down these things. So why would that be therapeutically interesting? I am certainly not suggesting that we identify these bacteria and then inject them in large numbers into the body. That might be counterproductive. Um, what I'm suggesting is that we look at the bacteria genetically, we figure out how they're doing it, we identify the enzymes that they're encoding that allow them to break down these substances, and from there we um, figure out how to change our own cells by putting those genes in so that we have an enhanced capacity to break things down and we therefore don't accumulate these things in the first place, and if we've already accumulated some of them, we get the genes in and the stuff that we have accumulated goes away. All right, so um, this is the concept. Graphically, we have a process that goes on in the human body that turns young people into old people and eventually into dead people. Um, and then we have a completely different process that turns dead people into decomposed people. And that process is encoded in the microbial ecology of the environment of the dead people. And uh, if we can just figure out, doing standard but laborious molecular biology, how that's actually happening, then we should be able to modify our own cells. This is my uh, um, certainly bad cartoon of a neuron, um, that, um, that um, will therefore be able to actually combat the process that turned young people into old people in the first place. All right, so, hello? There we go. So it turns out this works. Um, here's, the first, here's a graph that comes from the first paper we published in this, um, in this area, published it last year. We've had a couple more papers out since then, lots more coming. Um, and it's pretty damn impressive, really. We wanted to get rid of this stuff, this is public enemy number one in atherosclerosis, the main compound in terms of both its abundance and its toxicity that accumulates in the artery wall in those cells that are normally able to process cholesterol and eventually cease to be able to do so. Um, 
And it turns out we can find bacteria quite easily that are able to break this stuff down. We're doing a, a typical experiment here. We've got seven different bacterial strains. We give them a bunch of this stuff. We don't give them anything else to live off. So their growth rate is determined by um, whether they can eat this stuff. And also, of course, the abundance of the substrate of this stuff in, the, in their environment is determined by that. And as you can see, five of these strains couldn't do anything at all with the stuff, and so it just sits there. Um, but in as little as 10 days, these other two strains were able to get rid of it entirely. So that's extremely promising. And, of course, then we were moving on to the um, question of how they do it. There are various ways to analyze bacteria that are doing a particular thing to figure out how they're doing it genetically and bi biochemically. This is one approach that we use, mass spectrometry, which essentially identifies the breakdown products of the early enzymatic reactions that are going on to, um, to degrade these substances. And from there, we can figure out what enzymes are actually doing that process. So that's all going very nicely now. And we're just at the early stages now of a really important next step, which is to transfer those genes into mammalian cells and get them working there. 